Welcome to our 24th annual Writers' Symposium by the Sea at Point Loma Nazarene University. I'm Dean Nelson on the journalism faculty, and tonight we have Christian Wyman, a poet, an essayist, a translator, former editor of Poetry Magazine, and now a professor at Yale Divinity School. I have admired Christian Wyman's work from afar for years and years, and I can't tell you how awesome it is to have him with us at our university and at the Writers' Symposium tonight. Christian Wyman, it's a privilege to have you with us. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Dean. It's great to be here. <clears throat> when, when you first started writing poems, you wanted to write a poem that would last forever. And then a poet that you know pers knew personally and one that I admired from afar, Donald Hall, sort of disavowed you of that notion. Do you remember what he said to you? Yeah, he was, uh, he told me we were, we were having hamburgers in Chicago and he, he, um, he said he was 38 years old when he realized that not a word he wrote was going to last. And he said it just as casually as he took a bite of his hamburger. Um, and it just so happened that I was 38 years old <laughs> at the time, which Don obviously knew and you know, he was, he was giving me a little hint, I think. Uh, I mean, the miracle is, if you think of Don at the age of 38 having the realization that nothing he wrote was going to last, he went on to write another 50 years. You know, he didn't die till he was just under 90, 89, just this past August. So he went at it for another 50 years. So that's the really miraculous part and the uh, paradoxical part. That if you know something's not going to last, I think he might be wrong about that, actually, but with his own work. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you think that, and, and most writers do suspect it, even T.S. Eliot suspected of, of his own work, um, why persist? So, wh yeah, if, if you took that seriously, why did you persist? Well, because I think at some point, the notion of uh, securing immortality through a work of art, of, of putting a kind of rock in the river of time, um, is not what you're after. You're after the experience of making the, you're after the experience of participating in reality, of salvaging reality, is how John Berger puts it in, when he's talking about Van Gogh. He says reality has to be salvaged. And, and uh, that's what poetry does for me. It does it for me when I'm writing my own, but it does it when, I, when I read a poem that I really respond to, I feel like reality has been salvaged, like I can experience it again. And so you're doing it for that reason, because you believe that the, that moment of inspiration, uh, which some people do believe is the Holy Spirit, that that's what survives. And the work itself, uh, that's not necessarily the most important thing. Wasn't it, what was Robert Frost's line about the goal is to make sure that your poetry, that, that people will remember a couple of your poems? Oh, it lodges in the heads of, of a few readers so that they can't get rid of it. That's right. That yeah. sounds better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that sounds better. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, guessing, um, I'm guessing he was a little bit wrong, too, because his stuff has... Oh, I think he thought he was going to last, though. I think he, I think he, had, a, he had a good sense he was going to last. Um, and he, he does. He has, you know. But you know what? If you think of what lies, think of all the poems one writes. Randall Jarrell said famously that a, a good poet is someone who, after standing out in, a thun in, in lightning and thunderstorms for, for their lifetime, gets struck five or six times. So you write five or six good poems, and it's, it's, meanwhile, it's a destructive lightning strike, you know, that <laughs> metaphor. But, <laughs> but if you get hit 10 or 12, well, then you're a great poet. That's what he said. So 10 or 12. And poems that somebody keep, that, that a culture decides to keep makes a great poet. So it's, you know, it's not that much. Did you have to change anything about how you were approaching it after Donald Hall said that to you? Did you kind of lower your bar a little bit? No, I, by that point, I mean, I, I, uh, I had come to some kind of accommodation by that point. Not, it wasn't quite that stark, though. Don put it so starkly. That just, I mean, I think everybody retains some sort of illusion that something's going to last. Uh, and I can't believe, I, I haven't, I, it would be disingenuous of me to say that I've renounced that. I want my poems to be read 100 years from now. I'm aiming for that. 
I mean, I work really, I work hard to make them last. Um, but I do think you have to let go of that. A poet that I've loved recently is Yehuda Amakai, the great Israeli poet, and he's, he says at one point that he wants, he, he, he's not, it's not clear exactly what he's talking about, but I'm pretty sure it's poetry. He says, not like a cypress, but like the grass. So he doesn't want to be this iconic thing towering over people that's the memorial. He wants to be like the grass, and so it's everywhere, it's available, it's in people's lives, and I aspire to that as well. You know, I, th I think you said once that um, writing poetry is trying to address some sort of an absence. Uh, A, I'd like you to explain what that means, and B, isn't that really what all art does? It's a good question. I always did think, I mean, for the longest time, I thought that art arose out of some sort of destitution. Dickinson calls it sumptuous destitution. <laughs> Sumptuous. Uh, yeah. that's, that's a good word. Yeah, sumptuous destitution. Um, I, thought it, I thought it was always trying to fill some lack. Because if you didn't have the lack, why would you make the art? Uh, if, you're, if everything's just right in your life, the old expression is light writes white. That's the famous modernist expression, light writes white. So if everything's great, if your life is all light, well, then you got a blank page. It's white. Light writes white. There's no inspiration. You've got to, there's got to be some friction, some tension. Something's got to be wrong <laughs> in order for you to, you know, get some ink on the page. Um, I, don't, I don't really believe that anymore. Uh, it seems to me, I actually think that Nietzsche had it right when he said that he judged all work uh, based on whether it arose out of hunger uh, or superabundance, one or the others. And, and he had contempt for the ones that were, came out of hunger. He was only interested in the ones that came out of superabundance. Um, I think a couple things about that. I think the line is too strong, too, too stark. I think actually that those, um, those things, hunger and superabundance, can be linked and fused with each other. But I do, um, part of my maturation as a writer and just as a person has been learning to recognize moments of joy, of superabundance, of excess, and those have definitely led to art. So. Yeah, b however, story in, in story, which is more my area than, than poetry, it seems like only conflict is interesting. So I, I, if everything's going great, I'm not probably in a mind to write about it. I'm not sure. I think more and more I, I feel, uh, and I respond to poems that manage to to help me to recognize joy. Hmm. Um, I mean, I did a whole anthology of poems that, about joy. Uh, it is true that in this, on this side of the grave, uh, on this side of Eden, that uh, there is no unalloyed joy. Uh, Richard Wilbur has a wonderful poem where he's looking at a brook, Hamlin Brook, and he describes it all the way down very beautifully and that it ends, joy's trick is to supply dry lips with what can cool and slake, leaving them dumbstruck also with an ache nothing can satisfy. Joy's trick is to supply dry lips with what can cool and slake. It gives you complete sustenance, complete satisfaction, leaving them dumbstruck also with an ache nothing can satisfy. Now, Wilbur was a Christian, as it happens, so I don't think he means nothing, as in nothingness. I actually think he means nothing but God. That a moment of joy is, is a moment of God, uh, and it requires something of you afterwards. So there is still some sort of uh, conflict in a moment of joy. Okay, no, that, that makes sense. I, I'm remembering a, a story that you told uh, in in one of your essays, and I, you're one of the few people whose essays move me as much as your poetry. I, that's a, I think that's a tough, uh, tough gig, so congratulations. <laughs> but but the, uh, it's the story you tell um, about confronting your father, and he strikes you, mm -hmm. and then you strike him. And then very shortly after that in this essay, 
you have moved away and started writing poetry, you say, to get as far away from all of that as you can. Was that one of the motivations for writing poetry, was just to not be part of that whole West Texas thing you were involved in? Oh, definitely. My de poetry seemed to me s as far as I could get from the life that I grew up in, that it, was, it just was so, f I never had met anyone who was read poetry, it was never a part of my life, and, and the people that I knew were hard scrabble and rough, and, and uh, it just wouldn't have existed in that context at all. And so, initially, uh, I thought I was going into poetry for that reason. It just seemed to me so far from it. I'll go into the furthest thing I can find. Um, but then it turned out that the kind of intensity that I discovered in poetry that I was after uh, matched up pretty closely with the kind of intensity that I thought I was fleeing, that <laughs> those two things were, were fused in a way. And that not just, it, partly it was a formal energy, the form of the art had a kind of crackling energy to it that I recognized from the emotional dynamics of my childhood. But then just the subject matter, then the subject matter just started coming into my poems and I wrote poems about uh, a lot of those people that I'd grown up with. I think you've even said that sometimes you don't feel like you write poems, it's like poems happen to you. Sometimes that's true, that, and I can point to the very poems. I mean, it's definitely not true of all of them. Uh, some of them I work on for a long time, and some of them, uh, I've, I've carried poems for a decade, actually, and not finished them, and, and not been able to finish them for a decade. So those I feel like I have much more hand in. Uh, but some of the others do feel like they just happen. Like they just, those are the, the, the gifts. Those are the ones, you, you, don't, you can't even be proud of them, really. It's just like they just, it's just something that happened to you, and there they are. Uh, yeah, like, I think, like, there have been some where you've just, you wrote it, and it, it, you, you more like channeled it than, than created it. Would that be accurate? Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's I find that, uh, I'm 52 years old, I've been writing poetry now for, oh, since I was 18, 19. Um, I mean, younger than that, actually, if you count what I did when I was uh, seven years old, but at any rate, um, a long time. And it is as much a mystery to me now, if not more, than it's ever been. I understand, it. I, I don't understand where the poems come from. I can do nothing to make them come. I, I seem powerless to, to make them come. Uh, and powerless uh, to determine their quality. Like I can't, it's, it's quite, uh, um, and it's, I mean, in one sense, it's, exal it's an exalting feeling. It's wonderful to have that in your life. On another, it's, it's frustrating to spend your life learning this thing and still feel so baffled by it. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned the poem, I'm sorry for laughing, but the, you mentioned the poem of when you were seven. That's really what launched you, right? Your That's first what published. launched my career, yeah. I, 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 uh, we were attending the First Baptist Church in Dallas, and um, which at the time was the largest Baptist church in the world. It took up four city blocks. They had a bowling alley. A, a, uh, um, uh, I mean, it was huge. They had a, you know, multiple gyms and all these uh, multiple services on Sundays with thousands of people. And so we would go there, and um, at the end they had an altar call. And one day uh, when it came time for the altar call, I slid out of my pew and... My parents thought that I was going to be saved. That's early for Baptists. You know, I, was, I think I was eight, actually, but I think I was nine, actually. Eight or nine. I can't remember. Um, and I slid out and went all the way down front. You know, it was like a mile down to the front of the, <laughs> of the uh, um, auditorium and gave, my, gave a piece of paper to Brother Criswell, who was the uh, minister of the, he was like the head of all Southern Baptist um, convention, and the and it was a poem. Uh, I mean, it's like had you just written it in church that day? Or? No, no, no. I, I don't remember, but I assume I had written it earlier and brought it to church, and this was going to be my offering. This was like I was offering this to the church. Uh, some people offer their soul. I offered a poem, you know. And <laughs> it, at, I mean, it's so metaphorically apt. At the altar call, I give a poem instead of myself, 
but the poem was, I love the Lord and he loves me. I will not forget and neither will he. It's genius, man. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then he published, he, he published it in the Southern Baptist Newsletter, and, which is enormous. I mean, it's an enormous publication. It's like my biggest publication is in the Southern Baptist Newsletter at the age of eight years old. Well, there's some real clarity to that poem. Exactly. Then it was a long, dry spell <laughs> after that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but would, wouldn't you say that you spent a long time trying to reclaim that clarity? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, it's, I mean, that poem haunts me, actually. Why? Uh, um, because I do forget. I love the Lord and he loves me. I will not forget and neither will he. I forget all the time. I forgot for 20 years. Hmm. Uh, you know, so I, it's, it, I guess for that reason. You did go through a dry spell. In, ter in terms of poetry? Or yeah, in terms it, of yeah, yeah, in terms of writing poetry, where you just felt like you couldn't write. There was. Yeah, I went for three years without writing anything. And Do you know why? Uh... I guess I, I, um, I guess I would answer in different ways. I had reached the end of one kind of writing and had nothing else to say. That's the easy answer. The harder answer is, uh, I think God said, stop. Stop, this is, the, you're going in the wrong direction. This is not, uh, you're, 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 you're desecrating your gift. And, hmm. um, um, and so, yeah, I had three years of not being able to write, and it was excruciating for me. Uh, I mean, that's the way I defined my life, was as a poet. It's what mattered to me. And, and then I had three things happen in quick succession. Uh, I met, and uh, the, the one I'm now married to, uh, this was 15 years ago, and uh, I got very sick with cancer. That happened shortly after we met. And then one day we walked into a church together, which was at the, on the corner of our, the street where we lived in Chicago. And it was a United Church of Christ. We just walked in. I didn't even know what that was. We just walked in because it was at the corner. It just happened to be the church on the corner. And there was a preacher there. It was a little church. There were about 40 people in there. And the preacher was a guy who was young, had, had gone to Yale Divinity School, and um, this was his first job, and he was just tearing up the place. I mean, he was, he was like, uh, I mean, he's gone on to take over a big church, and the, he's become one of my closest friends in, in my life, and our families are very close. We spend, our, we spend holidays together. And, uh, but it was a total random thing. Of completely random, completely random, and... and uh, and I walked out of that first service and went home and wrote a poem, the first poem in three years. And I wrote it in like an hour. And it was the title poem of one of my books. And, uh, and it kind of really, I would say that moment, that really changed my life. I mean, the, everything I wrote after that was different. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was quite dramatic. This is what I find so fascinating, though, is that on the one hand, for those three years, you felt like, poetry was taken away from you. Like s there's some force, God or whatever, it took poetry from you. Then you fell in love and that sort of opened you up again. And then you started writing again. Love did that? Yeah, I think that's, I, I definitely think that's the answer. I mean, I think, I think uh, human love does it, it contains or catalyzes the love of God. It wants to be more than it is. Uh, it's always moving through us. It's not something we possess. It moves through us and wants to be more. Um, so yeah, it was like it really was like an electroshock in my soul. It was like it was it was powerful. I, one of my favorite statements I've ever heard you say is that love is on the move, or I think you said love is always on the move. And it's for this very reason, right? Yeah. It, it just because it moves through you. Yeah, I think it moves through you. It moves the sun and the stars, as Dante says. Uh, um, it's oh, that's the that's the wonderful thing. I mean, I think there is a terrible aspect to love. I think God's love also includes all of the destructiveness of the world, and I think that's sometimes hard to hard to comprehend. 
that uh, we were talking of Job earlier and the, the vision that, that God gives Job at the end of the book of Job is a, is a vision of predation, creation, but also violent predation. Uh, blood and he feeds the animals, he feeds the, the, the raptor its meat and uh, this is God doing this. Um, I think that is love too. I think, I think God's love is, is incomprehensible in, to some extent. It's quite intimate and comprehensible in the, in the realm of human love, but it's also incomprehensible and it includes our destruction. Uh, and I don't, and I think that's a very, something we resist. What does our destruction have to do with love? <laughs> well, we're all going to die, and we're dying because of God's love. I mean, God's love can rescue us, but it is, but we are in this creation, uh, which, and I take it, the action of love is, is, includes all of creation, and, and that's a lot of destruction. Hmm. Which is, uh, I think, one of the things you've said that poetry does is it connects you with ultimate reality, which, is, which would include, I guess, death. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's connecting you with both of those things at the same time. I mean, ultimate life and ultimate death at the same time. So one of the things I think you've said about poetry is that it takes you fully into the present. Uh, not out of the present, it takes you fully into the present. Um, so what is, what is that, because I think I've also heard you say something about we're never actually fully in the present. We're, we're remembering things from the past, we're projecting into the future. So I don't, to you, what is that whole, what does it mean? What does present mean? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it's an illusion. I mean, I think, I think poetry does make a moment of time possible for us. It seems like it's a moment of time of the present but consciousness can't actually be present. I mean, we are, we are always in the past. Uh, I guess what I mean is, um, R.P. Blackmer has a great, he's a critic that's uh, from the middle part of the 20th century, um, uh, where he says that, a, he's talking about John Berryman, and he says a metaphor, a, a new metaphorical impression um, uh, makes reality newly available. It uh, enlarges, enlarges, the availability, the available amount of reality. How does he put it? Enlarges the available scope of reality, or something like that. Um, what he means is not that it it makes reality larger in the way that space is getting larger. The universe is expanding. What he means is that it makes more of it available to us. And I think what what a moment of 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 poetic perception can do is um, uh, make the present moment of reality absolutely in front of you. Uh, get, make it make it apparent, uh, almost touchable. Not quite. Joy's trick is to supply dry lips is what can cool. It's leaving the dumbstruck also with an ache. Nothing can satisfy. That condition seems to me ineluctable. Um, but the poetry can get you close. Poetry is it's almost there. Yeah. When you got your diagnosis for cancer, which it just amazes me that that was left for you as a voicemail. Um, that, and you were told that this was gonna be fatal. At, at some point did you say, oh, I gotta write about this? I gotta, I gotta fully engage this and fully inhabit this? Did you think like that? No, it was, but it was very natural the way it happened. Um, uh, I did get it as a voicemail. Isn't I've that had just doctors, a little galling right, to have a, something like that left you on your... I've had a doctor, throw, I've had a doctor uh, throw a disc. He couldn't get to work in the computer. I've had him throw it across the room and it hit me in the throat. Um, I've had a doctor <laughs> draw me a graph uh, showing me when he thought I was going to die, showed the, showed the line where he thought I was going to die. Uh, I mean, I've had some, some really cruddy things done some wonderful things on the other side, more wonderful, many more wonderful than, than, than those examples. You are still alive. I'm st exactly, exactly. <laughs> so there's <yeah>. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but did you feel like you, I, I want to try to capture what this feels like? Did well, you I wrote that? an essay about it. Um, I mean, that, that poem that, that I was mentioning, 
was probably one of the first things I, would have been the first thing I'd written, yeah. Uh, which, that poem, the poem that I'm talking about is pure celebration, hmm. pure praise. Uh, Why praise? Why not condemnation? Why not rage? I was enraged, but I felt the love of God. Uh, um, Christianity does not give you, Simon Weil says that Christianity doesn't promise any supernatural, it may not give you a supernatural relief from suffering, a remedy for it, but it does give you a supernatural use uh, it, that, that Christianity promises that there's meaning. Um, it is a mystery to me. I was enraged, I was in love, and it looked like I was going to die, and I felt the love of God very intensely. Very, very intensely. So does and so that there was a kind of joy. It was joy. Uh, I mean, I was terrified and furious and full of lament, but I was also joyful. Uh, it, it is quite mysterious to me. I, I, I don't. That's why I think that you have to see both sides of creation and destruction. These things are happening at the same time, at every instant, and uh, reality is awesome, as in terrible. Um, and and I, I think it's, you know, it's, it doesn't hug you and exactly. Uh, but in answer, part of the answer, another answer is that when I needed to write something about it, I turned to prose. And, and uh, I wrote this essay, which um, went kind of viral. I mean, it went everywhere. And, and, uh, is this I've the ne- American Scholar? Yeah, yeah I've yeah. never published it. Any- I published it there, but I never put it in a book or anything. But it was, it was uh, just this short little essay about getting, a diag- getting the diagnosis, about stopping writing poetry and getting the diagnosis. And it was maybe, I mean, short, like six pages. Um, that essay I originally wrote for the church newsletter. Um, they asked me to write something for their Christmas newsletter. And I started to write something, and I thought, well, this is what I'm thinking about. And then, and then I was, I, I was going to do it in one hour, and I couldn't, and I was like, well, I'm a professional. <laughs> i got to go ahead and write something. And so I really wrote something, and, um, and it turned into that. Which then turned into, because of the popularity of it, turned which into turned into book. My Bright Abyss. Yeah, yeah. So an essay, and then the re- reader response... A church newsletter first. A church yeah. newsletter. <laughs> Let that be, well, it's just a continuation of your early church newsletter from when exactly, you were nine. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of uh, connecting those dots. I can say with confidence that that book, My Bright Abyss, is the most beautiful and profound expression of the mystery of suffering that I have ever read. I just found it startling. And, and this is the measure of it, of how beautifully written it was, I thought, even though I knew you had written it, I thought you were gonna die by the end of the book. <laughs> that would have been a trick. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but that's, that's, how, that's how moving this whole thing was. I just thought, oh my gosh. But I wrote it thinking I was gonna die. I mean, I, I wrote it, I finished that book in the hospital as I, as I was getting a transplant. I put it together as, as I was getting a transplant, and, and I, um, uh, I put it all over the room. I had it spread out all over the hospital room, and, uh, and I was working on it. Um, and I was, I was quite lucid, even though I was just, I mean, blasted with chemo and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, was, I, was, I put it together in those circumstances. Why did you feel so compelled to write about it? Why not just, I got I to gotta survive this, I got to get through it, or I got to give up and I got to die. Why would you, you want to try to record all this? I wasn't trying to record, there's not that much about cancer in that book. That's true. There's, there's very little. Uh, I was trying to record the experience of God. It just huh. seemed, and, I mean, I'm a writer. And it's like, I, that's how I, I was trying to survive, too. I was trying to keep my mind alive. I was trying to give form to all of these things. And it, w- it would have been impossible for me not to write when all that was going on. I think one of the, the uh, most amazing lines out of it said, uh, and, and I can't even remember now whether it was in My Bright Abyss or elsewhere, but about this cancer, you said, when my life broke open, 
I knew very well I believed in something. Exactly what I believed, however, was considerably less clear. <laughs> so was that during this time that that drove you? You believed in something because you just felt this joy and this love? Yeah, I wanted to articulate it. I wanted to try to articulate it. I mean, I really think that book circles around the big uh, question mark or hole or something. It doesn't, it doesn't answer the questions that it poses at the outset. Um, and how could it? You know, how could it? No one else has managed to. Well, and that's one of the reasons why we write, isn't it? Just, just pursue those questions as far as we can? Yeah to, yeah, to have the questions be alive in us. I think they, and every generation needs them differently. I mean, some, some of the, the, they need to be reformulated for us again and again. Uh, the question of how God exists. I think God's existence needs to be re-experienced again and again. It's not, the way we experience God is not the same as, as the way they experienced it a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. It's, it's always changing. What do you mean by the term accidental theology? You've used that in the past. What does that even mean? I, um, I teach a course at Yale Divinity School called Accidental Theology, and, and uh, what I do is uh, I use a different kinds of art or different kinds of writings, or even uh, yeah, I've used some movies, um, even works of art at a museum. Um, I think that a lot of the best theology, the truest theology these days is being done outside of the field of theology and is in the work of artists or thinkers of other, of other sort. And um, Film, perhaps? Film, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I find it in poetry all the time. Uh, uh, my understanding of God enlarged by people who themselves would uh, not claim to have any belief in God. Um, and so accidental theology is, is when uh, the, I see this happening. You know, so uh, partly it's, it's to answer a, a need, I think. I think my students are hungry for this. Uh, they're getting theology in their other classes and they're really hungry to see it in these, these other forms. Uh, so that's, and partly it gives me a way to read anything I want to read. You can basically, you can put anything on a syllabus called accidental theology. <laughs> so, so here's another, th this, this is back to this sort of, uh, w try this, this quest that we're, that we're all on. You once said, I always have this sense that something is going to resolve my spiritual anxieties once and for all. That one day I'll just relax and be a believer. How's that working out for you? Yeah, really well. Really well. It's going great. <laughs> you got it all nailed down now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, my, my fate is, to be, is for it to be, a, to be an agony. There's no doubt. But, I mean, that, that is my fate with poetry, too. Uh, my relationship with my own work is antagonistic. Uh, I, I'm not fond of it. I get no pleasure out of reading it. Um, I take a lot of pleasure in other people's work. I love it. Uh, I can get very excited by it. And, but my own work, I can, I can do without it. I can't stop writing it, but, but uh, I, it, it, does, it leaves me cold. Well, maybe it's that, uh, you know, Peter Matheson once said that uh, a work of art is never completed, it's only abandoned. Yeah. Maybe. He, he was quoting Paul Valéry, but, but yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's it. Yeah. You got a deadline. <laughs> yeah. So here it is. Well, let, let, I want to go back to the, the theology point. Why, so why is art so much better at theology than theology? You know, maybe it's not in all times, but maybe there are certain times when um, we need God expressed differently. Uh, maybe we've looked away or we've looked in the wrong place. I don't know. I mean, I think, I, I think Protestantism has, has really... Uh, neglected art to its own detriment and sort of calcified uh, um, because it doesn't admit of mystical experience and uh, doesn't uh, believe in the natural theology or the sacredness of the created, created world. Um, it believes in, I, was, I, I grew up learning about the fallen world. The world is something you have to escape from. I mean, the world is something that needs to be transformed. Uh, I think art is a way of 
of uh, understanding God lavishing his love on the created world. And so that's why. And I also think theologians, I mean, some of my best friends are theologians. Mm-hmm. Um, mine, mine too, they're smart, <laughs> they're smart people, yes. they're good and deep people. But theology has done what so many um, of the humanistic disciplines have done and worked itself into a tiny little corner of uh, jargon and uh, kind of group speak uh, where they're speaking to each other. Not all of them. I mean, I love some of Rowan Williams. There are theologians I, that I've learned an enormous amount from. Um, but the field in general can be frustrating. You could, you could say the same thing about the study of literature or poetry. That's where, I, yeah, I think there's a direct analogy. Uh, yeah, that we uh, we study it to a point where we've sucked all the life out of it. Yeah, yeah. And if think of all the PhD students who who uh, come out hating literature. It happens yeah. all the time. Yeah. Why is that? Well, for that very reason, you 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 go into it because you love reading the books, you love responding to it, and then suddenly you've got to put them in these these use these formula to. Uh, um, figure out what's wrong with all these books, or you know what they, what they've done wrong, and it's just it becomes tedious. You, you've got these great lines in in one of your poems, a, a poem called "The Ice Storm." You have these lines, and who would guess that as the years find their final focus, you're bothered less by the dark that lies ahead of you than the dark that lies behind. It's just such a beautiful way of looking at uncertainty. So you're okay. I, I, you, we're, I'm kind of back to another, qu- th- an old question where that's where you're headed in your poetry is, is just to try to make some sense of uncertainty of the future? The future doesn't matter in that instance. It's not the dark that lies ahead of you that you're scared of. It's that the dark that lies behind. It's the chances that you've neglected mm-hmm. in the past. Uh, it's, the, it's the life that you haven't lived. Um, that poem, The Ice Storm, is about a couple, a man and a woman spending a single day together, long married couple, and it alternates with their voices. Uh, I knew them intimately. Uh, it's, and it's, a, it's, a sad, it's a sad poem, I think. And there's, I think there's a, the, speak, the person speaking that poem is realizing that there's a lot of unlived life behind her that she fears worse than the death ahead. That is a sad poem. Yeah. Do, you, do you live with that kind of regret? No. No, I don't. No, I've, I, uh, I'm happy with my life. I've gone all in with poetry. I'm, I'm, I, uh, if I hadn't gone all in with poetry, I think I'd be in real, real trouble. But I really went in. I really did it. So I don't regret that. You know, re- regarding, with, uh, regarding your reconnection with your faith, I'm reminded of that Mary Carr description where she said, I, to start, I s- decided to start acting like I believed in God, even though it seemed like horse dookie. <laughs> I just needed to. Was that sort of the same for you when you and your wife went to church? You just started acting like it? No. Uh, the way that happened was um, she initiated it, the way most things happen in our <laughs> relationship. Um, she said, let's go, and I went. And, uh, but from that point on, uh, it was not at all like that. It was urgent and immediate and very, very real. I was not acting. Uh, it wasn't, I know what Mary means. I, mean, I, know, I know, I mean, there are times when you need to simply act as if. And then, and then some kind of response can come. Act as if you believe in God, and then some kind of response often will come. But at that time, that, that's not the way it was for me. All right. L- let's talk about memoir for a second. You're not a fan, as I recall. Uh, I, I, I think I did write something critical at one point. I think you did. <laughs> I think you did. And I, <laughs> let me tell you what you said. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you were actually quoting Blake where, where, you, where he said, imagination had a higher plane than memory. 
Blake was much, Blake wasn't big on memoir either, as I recall. Uh, but here's my question. But why are we so drawn to memoir? That's the, that's the, one of the biggest genres there is. Bigger than poetry. So what's your Thanks. problem? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I wrote that when I was young. Uh, you want to know what else you said about it? No, no. <laughs> no. You called it a symptom of failing cultural imagination. Uh, I'm not sure I disagree. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 does, it does seem to me that, um, yeah, it probably is a symptom of, of cultural failure, of, of cultural lack of imagination, that we need to attach these things to a real life. We can't handle uh, a work of art. We don't respond to a work of art in the same way. Uh, you know, I don't read memoir much. Uh, I, I really almost never. I don't think of my books as memoirs. They get marketed that way because it sells them. Uh, but I don't, like, I just don't see how that book is a memoir. It has some elements, but not much. You draw from some incidents in your past to make a, a different point. But yeah, I wouldn't call it memoir either. But memoir is, it's big, man. I know. I, believe me. I've had, I've been, I have pressure put on me to write a straightforward memoir. Let's talk about uh, a, a different thing that you've, uh, that you've criticized. So, and, and that is uh, the lack of people's development of their inner life. You've said that we live in a world that is designed to eradicate the inner life. So how do we reclaim it? Poetry. There you go, there you go, <laughs> all right. Poetry will reclaim it and develop it. Uh, and I, I actually think you're telling the truth. I mean, this is what you think, right? I don't believe poetry's for everybody, but um, I, don't, I couldn't live without it. I don't know how people live without it, but clearly some do. Um, but I think it's beyond question that we live in a society that's designed to eradicate the inner life. I mean, if you don't, th if you don't think that the world we're in is, is bent on destroying your innerness, you're not paying attention. I mean, it's, it's designed to do that. And so I think reading... Uh, Serious poetry can be an act of resistance in that regard. Uh, it doesn't have to be poetry. You know, there are all kinds of, all kinds of experiences out there that can sustain a, the inner life. But I do think it takes a real conscious act now. It's not as if, you know, I'm reading Emily Dickinson, and, and at the time the, there was a, a fad for reverie. And they would actually, you know, uh, sort of sit around and, and have reveries like this was the, and sort of detach and you know have these kind of daydreams and this was something that they aspired to um, uh, it was it was a, it was like a cultural value um, now we don't have anything like that you know we, you have to really work at it you have to really set something in your life and say that if I'm gonna if my inner life is gonna survive I'm gonna have to do something I find it, it's, it's a tough thing. I think, I think it was, is it Pascal's line that you quote that says, all of the trouble in the world could be traced to man's inability to sit alone with himself in a room for an hour? Yeah, yeah. And this is, the, this is that development of the inner life. Not many people could just sit with themselves without their phones yeah. for an hour. Yeah. I think uh, um, you've, You've talked about different ways that poems come to you, how some take you 10 years and you're still not done, and, and then some, you just bang, it's there, and you, you, you just say, uh, you, nailed it, you nailed it. Is there any way that you can kind of create an atmosphere that would make it more likely to channel that poem? It, it's, it takes dead time. Uh, that's the problem. Um, you talk about creating an inner life, and we live in a culture without it. With, I mean, we also live in a culture that makes the creation of poetry very difficult, or at least the kind of poetry that I respond to. I have always found that if I'm going to write poems, I have to give them a chance. And, and that means creating vast tracts of dead time, and where, I, where I have no obligations. 
I mean, I don't schedule a lunch. I certainly don't teach a class. I don't, I mean, nothing. I mean, it really has to be vacancy. And sort of day after day of it, and... And it still might not happen. It, well, that's the, that's the danger of poetry. That's why there's no practical uh, reward. There might not be, it might not happen. I might, you might create all this space and then nothing happens. That's happened to me. In fact, my Bright Abyss, I started because I went down to um, Marfa, Texas. There's a foundation there that gives these houses to writers for a while. I went down there and, for a couple of months and, and uh, um, it was the first break I'd had in quite a long time. And, and I um, sat there for one month, you know, four, four solid weeks, nothing. Nothing. Couldn't figure out what to do with myself. I, I would read. I would go on runs. I would do whatever. And and um, um, and and then one day after that month, out of sheer frustration, I started writing the notes that that are the beginning of that book. I wrote the first paragraph, and then and then I just thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And then I wrote another paragraph, and then and then it just it was eight years later, but eight years of it, it emerged, but it emerged out of that, all that silence uh, when it seemed like nothing would come. That just is so counter to how we live. Yeah, it's very, yeah. And I used to arrange my whole life like that. I mean, really long periods of time in solitude, and, but it's just not possible anymore. Uh, a lot of contemporary poetry, as you have uh, written about, probably needed some more of that dead time. In fact, here's one of the things you said about contemporary poetry. You said you feel like, you've read some contemporary poetry <laughs> where you felt like the poet wrote it while eating breakfast. You can almost hear him still chewing. <laughs> <laughs> that was you saying that. So that would reflect the opposite of what you just described, right? Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of, um uh, the contemporary poetry I read does seem to come, to, seem to me to add to the confusion of contemporary life rather than, rather than rescuing me from it. Is that its job, is to rescue you from it? That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> if you want confusion, <laughs> that's the poetry for you. <laughs> you know, one of the things I, I, I love about what, what you do and, and write about is you talk about how uh, a person's soul you know, which is what we've been talking about, I think, is, is that inner life, that uh, that gets confused with the self. So what's the difference between a person's soul and a person's self? I think of the self as, as um, an aspect of personality. It's the personality that we're expressing all the time. It's, it's uh, us meeting each other. It's the way we interact. It's um, occasionally you meet someone's soul, uh, and and you, you're aware of that, but that's pretty rare. Um, I, I think of the, the soul as being our inner life. Now, whether you can share that, I asked a, a class of Divinity School students the other day, uh, we were reading um, Nietzsche, and uh, Nietzsche says that uh, the, the greatest suffering of humans is the fact of their loneliness. Essentially, that's not the way he puts it, but it, it's that, it's that essentially we are sealed off and that one consciousness is sealed off from another and there is no way to broach that ultimately. You can pretend you are. We have language and you, know, you can make love, you can do this, whatever, all the, all the things that we do to uh, try to meet each other. But ultimately, you're sealed off. And uh, I asked a class of Divinity School students, so is this true? Is this the greatest suffering? Is this, do you believe, you agree with Nietzsche here? And every one of them said yes. Hmm. They do, every single one of them. Uh, now I don't believe that quite. Uh, I believe that love makes possible um, uh, a connection of another person's soul. Uh, and not simply romantic love either. I mean, all, 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 love in all of its various forms. Um, Makes, makes a kind of ultimate communication uh, possible. Um, that is ultimately a form of faith, I guess, but I have no proof of it, but it's a form of faith. 
but I do, I do believe it. Hmm. You're, you're big on memorizing poetry, aren't you? Yeah. Why? Uh, several reasons. I, um, uh, I started memorizing poetry when I was younger, when I first started wanting to become a poet, um, partly because I didn't understand the poems that I responded to, and it was an attempt to completely understand them, and partly because I wanted to own them, like to possess them. When you're young, I think there's something very predatory in the way that you read. You're like always trying to get something out of it, you know, what you can get. And as you get older, I, as I have gotten older, I've found my reading habits are much more, are driven off them out of sympathy. Like I want to make connections with somebody. I read in order to make connections. Or uh, my, my wife really, uh, she, often she's reading something and so I'll start reading it for that reason. Or uh, It's simply wanting to make a connection. Um, but I, I read a lot of the poems, the first poems I memorized were there was something predatory. I wanted to own them. Hmm. Um, but now I do it out of love. I, I just love something. I want to carry it with me. And I want some sort of refuge from the chaos of the world around me all the time, the noise, the blab. I want, I want some, something clear and clean. And so if you were to tell your, any poetry students poems that they should memorize. Do you have a sort of a hall of fame? Not really, no, my, my list is quite eclectic and includes some poems that no one has even heard of, it seems to me. Uh, I mean, one of the, I've had one in my head from this Canadian poet, Robert Bringhurst. Now people know it because I quote it so often. Uh, but he's a typographer. He's a famous typographer. He's not known as a poet at all. But this thing just stuck in my head for years. I just wanted to have it. Um, so I would, I would say memorize. What I tell my students is, is uh, just make sure you memorize something that you love, that you really want to have in your head. You know, to make sure it's, make sure it's good. Yeah. Do you have any advice other than memorizing poems that you'd like to give our aspiring writers? Uh, the advice you're going to hear a lot is, which is the, the best advice, is you have to be a reader. Uh, there's not, uh, no one was ever a great writer without being a great reader. You have to read a lot of, you have to really love reading. That should be the first love. Um, I think another piece of advice that might have helped me when I was young is um, to find someone, this did happen a couple of times, but it could have been better. Find someone, um, uh, or a group, or a person, or someone with whom you feel a great kinship and can share work and can sustain each other in that way so that you can encourage each other. Uh, particularly if you're inclined to uh, solitude. Uh, uh, you can kind of drive yourself crazy in that, that kind of interiority. So find some support. Uh, that's actually a very good advice for a person of faith as well. Uh, I find that uh, it, solitary faith, any faith that remains completely solitary uh, becomes despair. Uh, that there is always an urge, always an effort, a need to share it or to, to understand it in translation with someone else. I want to wrap up our time this way. There are some lines at the end of your book, My Bride Abyss, that I would love to have you uh, turn to and uh, kind of share with us at the end. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So this is right at the end. My bone marrow is, according to my last biopsy, free of cancer, and the dozens of tumors that at times have been so aggressive that I could see and feel them protruding from my skin they have all shrunk to what my doctor says is probably just residual scar tissue. No one promises permanence. The chances are high that there is some errant malevolent cell swimming around plotting a comeback. But there is every reason to think that I am at the beginning of a long remission, maybe five years, maybe ten, maybe more. Even without this gift, though, this sense of promise and hope I have allowed myself to forget all the wonders and clarities that have come to me this past year, which has been a solid year of suffering and the sharp sense of death. 
I waste too much time in the little lightless caverns of my own mind. So much of faith has so little to do with belief and so much to do with acceptance. Acceptance of all the gifts that God, even in the midst of death, grants us. Acceptance of the fact that we are, as Paul Tillich says, accepted. Acceptance of grace. Grace. It is not at all coincidentally, I now think, the name of the street where my wife and I first lived together. It is the middle name of our firstborn child who with her twin sister has taught us so much about how to accept God's imminent presence. And it is, I am absolutely sure, the fearful and hopeful state in which my wife and I lay the first night I was home from the hospital after the transplant, feeling like a holy fever, that bright defiance of not death exactly, and not suffering, but meaningless death and suffering, which surely warrants, if anything does, the name of faith. My God, my bright abyss into which all my longing will not go, once more I come to the edge of all I know and believing nothing, believe in this. Christian Wyman, thank you for being with us today. Thank you.